Hello, this time we're talking about should we be surety for a debt? And what example do we have from the scriptures about God or Messiah, his son, doing this for us or any of the believers that are a great cloud of witness for us and our examples? And and when sh- should we and when shouldn't we? And if there's any questions about anything I'm saying here, Please send me a message. Ask the question. I'll have a lesson. It says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. God sent his son down here to die for us, that we can be made peace with God again. We are estranged from God, just like a harlot. And he sent his son to be surety for us. It says, Proverbs eleven fifteen: He that is surety for a stranger, which is us, shall smart for it. It means you'll be hurt. And he that hated the ship is sure. It says in the scriptures that he was marred beyond that of any man. He took that beaten. Remember, like a lamb before his shears is silent, he didn't cry out because he had nothing to confess because he was without sin. He took that punishment for us. He smarted for that because he came surety for strangers who are estranged from God. People might say, well, where does it say that he was a surety for us? Hebrews 7.22 By so much was Yahushua made a surety of a better covenant. He's the surety for a better covenant for us. Without him, we don't have no, we're not, our debt isn't paid without him. It says in Proverbs 17, verse 18, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friends. But Messiah did this, but with full understanding of what he was going to do. We were the ones that had no understanding. Remember he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he had full understanding. Remember in the garden where he said, Father, if this cup can pass from me. And he asked it three times. Is there any other way? And he said, if there isn't, then I will be done. I will do it. Yes, I will do it. And there was no other way. That's what he said. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend. He said, go and get your get yourself free from this when you do this. He couldn't. He went to the Father three times. There was no other way. How was he going to get free from it? He came down to do it and he did it. It says in Proverbs twenty seven thirteen and Proverbs 20, verse 16, Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. They took his garment, remember, and gambled over it. They separated his garment, and then the one woven piece, they said, let's not tear it, we'll gamble for it. That was fulfillment of prophecy. And here it says, take his garment and surety for a stranger. We are estranged, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. We are like a harlot all gone astray from God and he is our kinsman redeemer we are clothed with him we get his garment now and we split that garment up amongst us all because we need to be clothed with him that is surety for us that took our punishment just as you read about a pledge of him for a strange woman we are like that harlot and that pledge you think of Judah and Tamar And Judah gave her a pledge, and she was dressed as a harlot. And he came in under her, and they had a sexual union together. Remember, he was was Judah. Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah and is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he has given us a pledge with his own life. Judah gave his signet ring, his staff, you know, these things. And he was going to send a kid from the flock. 
Remember? Well, Messiah gives a pledge of his own life's blood and his own body to redeem us back to God, to be clothed with Messiah and his righteousness, to join in that marriage covenant. Remember, Boaz put his skirt over uh, the woman to cover her, and surely his garment was taken. Surely he is the surety for all of us. We were all strange from God, sold under sin like a harlot. His garment was taken as a surety for us, and our debt is paid. And once again, it says, any of surety, you'll smart for it. He did. He paid the price. He was marred beyond that of, of any man. Couldn't even recognize him. Also, in Genesis 43, 9, we have Joseph in, in Egypt. He's gone on ahead, and he's a type of Messiah in this, that he is the deliverer. But we also have Judah here, who is the tribe that Messiah is from, who is also a type of Messiah in this, because he says to Jacob, his father, to Israel, his father, he says, I will be a surety for Benjamin. And truly by this he went, because unless Benjamin came, Joseph wasn't going to give them any more food. So he saved all their lives in a way. And also he put himself in Benjamin's place and said, I'm a surety for him. Place him in my hands. And out of the tribe of Benjamin, we get the Apostle Paul. Out of the tribe of Judah, we get Messiah. And Paul wanted to know God. He'd studied and studied and studied, but he did not know him. He was persecuting the early believers. And Messiah appeared to him and spoke to him. And we see in the scriptures that God says he is my, that Paul is his chosen vessel and he will show him how much he must suffer for his name's sake. And he did. So we have Judah being a surety for Benjamin and then we have Messiah who paid the price and then out of this Paul comes and he is called and he is given the gospel and he is sent to the Gentiles. Remember, Judah would be, be a light to the Gentiles and Paul was part of that. So in all of this, well, it's not good to be surety for somebody when we see the Messiah has been surety for us, knowing that we can't pay our debt, knowing that we're stuck and in trouble, knowing that he didn't do anything wrong and it wasn't his fault, steps in and says, I will pay this debt for you. So I ask you, you can't bail your children out all the time. You got to teach them how to fish. But there is times that they're going to need you throughout their life for you to step in and say, this is my son, and I will take care of this. This is my daughter, and I will take care of this. And God knows the right time for everything. We want our children to be honest. We want our children to have integrity, to speak the truth. That's really what all this oath and swearing and pledging and all this is all about and vows and all this is. Are you really going to say what you mean? And are you really going to mean what you say? Right now, it's kind of ironic that I'm going through this because right now in our, in our nation, the president is trying to cancel loans. He, what he's really doing is trying to buy votes. He's trying to buy votes from a group of people that are young that have been brought up to be entitled for things. And I'm not saying everybody feels that way that's in this group. I'm sure a lot of them don't, uh, maybe more than we realize. But they've tried to get the children to believe that they're entitled to everything and be selfish and just take, take, take and not give back. And so he's trying to buy votes to get these people to think, hey, we'll cancel your loan and vote for me. Probably the same reason why he's letting everybody cross the border so that he can get their vote and to just destroy everything that that's going on anyway. If you 
put your name to something and sign something that you would pay something back, then you should pay it back. And you need to think about that. This is the housing market. I mean, they, you can get a loan and not have no money down and not have any kind of thing that you've ever, any history that you've ever paid a thing off in your life, and you can get this big old expensive house. And people don't ask why. And the reason is, is it's, it's, a, it's a big land and housing takeover because they know that you're not going to pay it back. They know that you can't possibly do it. And they're going to end up with the property. They know you're going to default on your loan. That's why they give it to you. They don't want to give it to somebody that's going to pay it back. They don't want to give it to somebody that's going to, I mean, even though they'd get paid twice for whatever you borrowed, if you, I mean, and if you borrow a, the money for a house that's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Time you get it paid off, you're probably looking at three hundred thousand dollars. So, so they got they got paid for a house that didn't even exist in that situation too. But that's not enough for greed. So that just keeps going. Now we want the house too. We'll take whatever little bit you get, and then we'll take the house. So why would that be important? Because if they end up owning all the properties on all the house, nobody owns nothing. We're all just tenants and slaves in a system where if they was to give us any money at all, it would just be enough to cover our bills and so we can never get out of the hole that we're in. Pretty nasty. I wasn't even planning on talking about any of this. Okay, let's 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 get out of this and talk about a different idea, a different thing that God has showed us. Okay? He says, Owe no one nothing but the debt to love. Going in debt is for for financial things is a bad idea, especially when you when you're learning stuff that you're not even going to be able to apply in reality, or it's something that uh, isn't really necessary. All wisdom, knowledge, and understanding come from God, and He doesn't charge you for it. So why not go to Him? It says to present all your requests to God. Besides, we're supposed to be training our children, everybody on this earth, to love God to listen to his voice and obey it. They're not going to teach you that in college. They're going to lie and tell you that God doesn't exist. So why would we spend a bunch of money to go in debt to become an unbeliever and be and be to where it's hostile to people that would believe in God? Why would we do that? It says, blessed are those that do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, the answer is you wouldn't. You wouldn't send your kids away to somebody that's going to teach them against God unless unless you're stupid or you just don't even realize yourself that God exists. It says the fool says that there is no God, so that's a foolish thing to do. But God says, owe no one nothing except a debt to love. So even if you were out of financial debt, which you should be, if you ain't got the money for it, you don't got it. And even if you had the money, it doesn't mean you're supposed to buy it. You need to ask him. So don't owe nobody nothing but the debt to love. So even when you get out of debt, you still got to maintain that. It doesn't just happen and stay that way. You have to maintain a debt freeness. That's not easy either. Then the debt to love. So when you think you're out of debt, you might be in a way, but you're never truly out of debt all the way because you still have the debt to love everybody. You have the debt to honor people. And uh, any time that you've sinned against somebody, you you have a debt there that needs to be straightened out, you understand, in a different way. There's a lot more to debt than just money. I don't think people realize that. And... So you're out of debt, you got to maintain it, and you have the debt to love, and then what? Then one of the ways to maintain it is not to get into somebody else's foolishness argument that they went to school for this and they, they don't now, somebody else has to pay for it. Not a good idea. But who don't make mistakes? We all do. But I tell you, the people running this country right now, they're putting us deeper in debt, but it's on purpose because they want to dump the dollar. They want to have a new kind of currency, whether it's uh, something that you can tangibly touch or not. The whole world will be on a new religion, a new world order that has a religious side to it, that has a new currency, and you won't be able to buy, sell, and trade unless you receive the mark of the beast. 
But people are already Roman-minded, which is the fourth beast of Daniel. This is the revived Roman Empire, whether you want to believe that or not. So if, if you go and you're following that, you already have those thoughts on your forehead and in your hand. That's what you do. That's what you think. You're already there. It, people don't realize it's not going to be just this one point up here. You're already going with the flow of that. So why would you go and jump into a spot that somebody else is in? Well, what I see is there's people that are outside the balance on both ways. Either either they're spool rotten their kids and their kids are rotten and they're ruined. You're not supposed to spoil your children, that's a lie. They end up ruined. You wouldn't buy spoiled spoiled meat at the store. You wouldn't buy spoiled fruit. You want good stuff, good fruit, good meat. You want your children to be good and do what's right. But if you're sitting there and falling for the lie, let's spoil them. That's what happens. Well, people are spoiling their children. They're ruining them. They've never disciplined them. They've never told them no. Just like my wife, she's seen somebody in the store, and there she is with her child acting like a total brat, totally disobedient, throwing a fit. And she says, you need to stop this right now or I won't take you to McDonald's. And he keeps going because he knows. And she keeps saying, better stop or I won't take you to McDonald's. And they keep on and on and on. He never stops throwing a fit because he already knows what's going to happen. She's already showed that she can't even hold the line. And when it's all said and done, you know what she says? Okay, are you ready to go McDonald's now? And... He never stopped throwing a fit. Where was the discipline? Oh, they've thrown that out and call it old-fashioned. Yeah, it's fashion of old from God. He says to discipline your child. If you spare the rod, you spoil your child. Make him rotten. He says folly's wrapped up in the child, but the rod of discipline will drive it out. Yeah, because they have this foolishness wrapped up in their heart. Anyway... What did she teach him? That that she didn't really meant what she said and that he could do whatever and he was totally in control and she's just going to give him whatever anyway. He's not going to listen to her. He's never going to listen to her and he knows how to manipulate her and she doesn't care. She doesn't care about her child and no matter what that child does, she'll say, he's, he, he's great, he's wonderful. It don't matter what he does wrong. And it's not true. And they'll they'll flatter these their own children to the point that they're so full of pride. And pride comes be, pride and a haughty spirit come before destruction and a fall. God brings down the prideful. He exalts the humble. God hates pride. So you have this one side of it, and uh, then you have the other ones. I mean, these people will give their children everything themselves. They don't want to spend time with them. They just throw gifts at them. But then you have the other side that they just, they wouldn't give a lift a finger to help their kid. Not one. Or anybody else. You see what I'm saying? Or anybody else. They're just, they're all about themselves and that's it. And they have no room for anybody else. This is, uh, what was that guy's name? He's, a, he's looked at as a big name now, but he, he was a despicable person. He didn't take care of his children. I mean, I think a couple of them, Karl Marx, that was, yeah, that was his name. He's a socialist, communist, Marxist. Oh, that's where Marxism comes from. But I don't remember. I think some of his kids starved to death. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't take care of his wife or children at all. He didn't care about them. He spent his wife's inheritance on on boozing around with his buddies. And I don't even think he was at his wife's funeral at all. He just, uh, he was a despicable person. He didn't care nothing about his family at all. So you have one out of balance. You have the other out of balance. What does God's word tell us? about being our brother's keeper or about who is our neighbor or about going in and placing ourselves as surety for somebody's debt. 
whether it's money or whether it's not, whether it's another kind of, you know, Paul becomes surety for Onesimus. Remember the book of Philemon? You know, Paul's in prison again for preaching the gospel. And Onesimus is in there, which was a slave to Philemon. And he ran off from Philemon, ended up getting in jail for whatever reason, and then he ends up being won by Paul through the preaching of the gospel. And now, you know, he's repenting, he's telling Paul's story, and Paul realizes he already knows his master, he knows, you know, the whole situation, so he's going to write to Philemon on Onesimus' behalf, who he says now is my my son in the faith. And and where, so where does he say that he's become a surety for him is verse 17 through 20, and I'll read it. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. He's saying, I'm sending him back to you. Receive him just as you would me. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, means anything. If he owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thy own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in, in Jehovah. Refresh my bowels in Jehovah. I have confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So Paul is saying, whatever he owes you, if he's done you anything wrong, I'll repay it. But receive him just as you would me. So Paul is saying, I'm being my brother's keeper. He's saying, I, this, is, this person's my family. This is my son Onesimus now. He was wrong. He was the prodigal. And he went away, and he was wrong for doing that. And he says, now, just like just like anything else, there's been a change in Onesimus. He's repented. You know, he wants to go back, and Paul's just trying to smooth it over with Philemon and telling him, whatever debt he has that he owes you, I will pay it. But he says, just remember, Philemon, you, you owe me your own soul in a way because... I was used in your life. Where would you be if it wasn't for me being used by God in your life? So so there we have Paul being surety for Onesimus, okay? We also remember when Messiah came and they were they had a choice to let somebody free and Barabbas was a murderer. Remember? A bad dude. And they said, do you want Barabbas or do you want the man from Nazareth? And they said, crucify the man from Nazareth. And we want Barabbas. So they, they kept on and they, they let Barabbas go and he took his place. And Barabbas means, his name means son of the father. And he took our place so we could be sons and daughters of the Father. When people say, oh, we're all children of God. Well, in a, in a sense we are, but when when sin entered the world, that passed, death passed to all of us, and we became estranged from God. Our sin separates it from us from him. But Messiah brings peace with God again in restoration because he pays the sin debt, okay? So then we have a right to be called sons and daughters of God so he took his place and he took our place he became that the scapegoat remember if you study about that so what about people that ain't your family you know people will say well I might I might do this for somebody if they were my son or my daughter or my brother but I ain't going to do that for somebody else. It says even if your neighbor's cow comes over on your property, you better bring it back to them. If you see something wandering off of your neighbor's property, you better. We're, we're to be a good neighbor. Let's go into Luke chapter 10. I'm turning pages. 
Luke chapter 10 is talking about the Good Samaritan, right? Everybody's heard that. And behold, verse 25, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willingly to justify himself said unto Messiah, And who is my neighbor? See, he had the right answer, but he was struggling in his heart about his own life, even though he had the right answer. Just having the right answer doesn't make you right with God. You have to live that out. And Messiah answered, saying, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance... There came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him Remember oil and wine, they were uh, healing agents and they're good food as well. On And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. See, he's become surety for that man. He said, I'll be my brother's keeper. He looked at him and said, this is my brother. He's made an image of God like me. I don't know what's befallen him. I don't know why this has happened to him. He didn't make assumptions. Oh, he must be this or must be that. That's what the people did that walked on the other side. The religious leaders. I'm not saying all religious leaders are bad. I'm just saying they have a tendency to get all high and mighty. And he said, whatever, whatever else... I'll, I'll pay it when I come back. means he's going to come back and see that he's okay. Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest was neighbor unto him that fell among the sea, thieves. And he said, He that showed him mercy on him. Then said Messiah unto him, Go and do likewise. So it's not just the person that's living right next door. This He didn't know this person. He just looked on him with love and said, This is my brother and I'm going to help him. Now, now be this known to you. If the same guy kept getting in all kinds of messes and this person after a while would say, I've, I've tried and you have not listened. He wouldn't keep bailing him out. I had a guy, I did jail ministry for four years. I'd bring the people home, I'd give them clothes, I'd try to give them a job, give them food from my table, everything. And most of them cussed me out when they left. That's their problem. I did what I was supposed to do. 
One guy, he would keep coming back. He came back seven, eight, nine times. But he was just using us. He never repented, and he was never getting right. And finally, I was released from the man. He would never get right. He would not repent. He was just wanting to use us. So when it comes to that over and over again, yes, we must forgive them seven times 70 and all of this to keep our relationship right, but we don't need to walk with somebody that will not repent of their sins and be born again and grow. Okay? Some people will give and give and give and give and they wear themselves out giving. Oh, I got to help them. I gotta... You, need to, you need to know the balance. Yeah, I give people the benefit of the doubt and I ask God, but there's times it says, that's enough. And... If this person would continue, when the Good Samaritan comes back, if he cussed him out and then he fell out again and the Good Samaritan helped, he's helped him seven, eight times, if he, if, then you let it lay. It's just like the fig tree. You tend around it and you work around it, but if it ain't going to produce fruit and you cut that fig tree down, it's dead. It's done. It doesn't want to live. It doesn't want life. So you have to have the balance. Remember Paul when he when there was a person in the church that had his father's wife and he said you guys are puffed up about this you should have thrown him out throw give hand him over to satan kick him out this is even what unbelievers wasn't doing he said and they did see and then he repented and then they wasn't going to let him back in and he said, you're out of balance over here. You won't do the right thing. You won't do righteous judgment. You won't throw him out when you need to. And he said, now that he's repented, he truly has. Now receive him back. You won't do that either. You're out of balance both ways. He said, find the balance. So everybody's your neighbor. You bear your own burden and you bear the burdens of others. And if everybody does this, there's going to come a time for love's sake and for, for learning how to love one another and give, there'll be times when people can't carry their own burden, and that's when we must help them. But like the teaching of the give a boy a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a boy to fish and he'll eat for life, we got to teach them how to fish. we got to teach them how to work and how to take care of their own everything. We got to teach them how to live so then they can teach others. If you don't teach your children, how will your children teach their children? See, most people aren't even in touch with that. They just, they may have one little pet peeve and they tell their kids about that. And otherwise it's, they give their kids away for somebody else to teach them. And they were never supposed to. So we see that on Onesimus, Paul became surety for him, but he was being true. We see the good Samaritan. He didn't know this person from anybody, and he helped him, giving him the benefit of the doubt. And if the person has any wisdom, knowledge, and understanding at all, they will walk true after this. Maybe they were already, and they fell in among thieves, and or maybe they were a rotten scoundrel. Either way, God has forgiveness for everyone. We need to be born again. The thing is, will the person stand up and follow God now? You may have a son or daughter that just you've enabled them and enabled them. They got to stand on their own feet. Or you may have a son and daughter that you've never helped out at all and never gave a hoot about. And that ain't right either. Maybe you got a neighbor that's taking advantage of you. You don't have to walk with them, but you, you need to pray for them to repent. God's got you living next to that person for a reason. To let your light shine. Don't let people that are set on evil ruin your relationship with God. Don't let the day be ruined because of, of them. That's what that's what people that are in turmoil love to do is bring you down into their mess. It's not about being a Samaritan or not. A lot of people didn't like the Samaritans. At, at the time where Messiah was here, they didn't they would go out of their way not to go there. And it's not that all priests or Levites are bad either. 
It, what he's doing is showing an example because people like to think that, oh, if you're this color, you're bad. If you're this color, you're good. All that's garbage. It's all lies. They want to think it's just the heart of the person. Or they want to think that, oh, if you have this much money, you're good. If, you have, if you're poor, you're bad. Or, it's just all lies. He says, love him and love one another. Obey his commands, and you need to know what they are. You can't do any of that by yourself. You can't just manipulate all that and become just like this fruit of the spirit factory. It just comes out of you. You've got to be born again. You've got to partner with God. You've got to be his helpmate, helping him do his will. You need him every day to do that. That's a relationship. You can't run around and go do it your own way and say, Oh, look what I did, God. That doesn't work. Not with him. You might go on that way for a long time thinking you're working for God. In fact, it says that in the, in the last days, it says that there will be many, many that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do good works? And he says, Depart from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. They didn't know him. They didn't have a relationship truly with him, working with him. They were over here doing this other thing and thought that they were doing good. And he says, you were doing evil. Totally backwards, man. You cannot stay in that. If you do, you, you are going to be in big trouble. They say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? There's so many false prophets out there right now teaching nothing but lies and filling their pockets. Don't listen to them. If they won't let you see for yourself and study for yourself, something's wrong. Before you buy some goods that somebody's selling, you better read the instructions. God gave you an instruction book. It's a love letter from him. You need to read it for yourself. Teach your kids to fish. Teach your neighbor to fish. You know right, why there's a food shortage in places? Because people aren't learning how to grow their own food. Messiah already said, Why work for what is not food? And then if you have food and clothing, be content with that. There's no contentment today. People want more and more and more. He says, the poor you always have with you. That's why they keep trying to say they're going to wipe out the poor. Yeah, they're going to wipe out the poor. They're going to wipe them off the face of the planet. The rich rule over the poor, and they oppress them. They hate the poor. They're going to wipe out the poor, and so there's no poor people left. Their idea is if there's somebody out there on the street that's homeless, well, they're just going to take them to a FEMA camp, process them, take whatever organs they want, and get rid of them. They don't care. That's how they'll get rid of the poor. He said, you always have the poor with you. Why? Because they continue. Each greedy person can't see past themselves to help anybody else. And they ain't going to be happy until everybody else is gone to where they have all the air to breathe themselves. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. You go to a nursing home. They should be with their family anyway. Where are they at? They're in a nursing home. Medicated and doped up. So that the people don't have to bother with them. They already hate what they have to do anyway. Now, I'm not saying everybody that works there feels that way. There's little people that are walking in the light of everywhere. But I'm saying there's a lot of that. Why can't we take those people and they be taken care of by their families? And if they was going to be in a nurse home, the next step, I guess is why can't they go out and do something? Why do they got to be basically made to stay in their room or or even in their bed sometimes? Come on. The elderly have been thrown aside and not cared about. The children have been murdered in the womb and not loved and cared for. And the ones that are allowed to live, they're taught lies from the from the cradle to the grave. It's ridiculous. That's why I say we have to restore the past to dwell in. People don't know how to live life now. They walked away from God. We have to repair the breach. The big hole in the wall and the enemy has come through and he's carried people away captive with his lies and deceit. We have to repair that breach and restore the past to dwell in and be the good Samaritan. And be our brother's keeper. Abel tried to be his brother's keeper with Cain. Tried to help him in the right way. So he would do what was right. 
and Cain killed him. He murdered him, his own brother. Do you want to be on the line of Cain or on the side of Abel? Do you want to love or do you want to hate? You know, these women say, my body, my choice about abortion, about murdering their own baby. What it should really say is, I hate my baby and I want to murder it. And I hate myself and I hate God because that's where they really are. And that's so sad and evil. God has forgiveness for them if they were repent of their murder and their hard heart. And men, you have a responsibility in this because you have left the women in charge and been henpecked instead of stand up and following God. Men, this country is in the shape it's in because we haven't prayed like we're supposed to and we haven't stood up and led and followed God. That's why. We have to own that. Somebody around you right now needs your help. If you're a man of God, somebody needs your help. Of course, your wife and children do. Maybe you've got a neighbor that's thinking about killing themselves. Maybe you've got somebody that can't make ends meet and they just need a little help. And they ain't got nobody. And sometimes it is messy. Sometimes it doesn't smell as good as you wish it would in that situation. How easy was it for Messiah to come down here, leaving, leaving heaven, and come down here? When our sin stinks to high heaven as it is, and he came down here anyway. When he knows his father is cursed every day, by people that don't know what in the world they're doing. And he came down here anyway to pay the price for our sin so that we could have peace with God again and have eternal life. If you are listening to this and you haven't accepted him, what are you waiting for? There is no other way out. You can never outdo the bad you've done on your own. You can never... You can never climb that ladder all the way and make it. It won't happen. I don't care how strong you think you are or how smart you think you are or how rich you think you are. You can't buy your way out of it and you can't think your way out of it. God has set it up this way. That's why it says the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. The good news is he always had the plan to save us from ourselves and our mess. But we must grow up. We must walk with him. It's not about going our own way anymore. He put up with that stuff for a long time. But in the fullness of time, he sent forth his son. And he paid the price for us. Now we we need to realize that we owe him everything. I mean, you get to talk to the one who knows all things. And he'll answer you. I've got so many things I want to learn. But there's so many things I need to learn that he knows that I don't even realize. And he'll teach me. As long as I say, Father, here I am. And not cut him out of my life. But make him the overwhelming all of it. Every moment, every day. Realizing that he is there and listening to him and obeying him so that I can hear him again. Just like you with your children. If they don't listen and don't listen and don't listen, you don't stop loving them. But after a while, you know, they come up and say, Hey, what, are you, what next, Dad? And you say, I already told you. And you didn't listen. So why should I say anything now? See, we need to have a good relationship with God and, and maintain that. It's not easy to maintain relationships. But with God, who's never done anything wrong, how hard could it be? How hard can it be to maintain a relationship with someone that's never sinned? Well, if if he wasn't love, then it would be very hard. That's why it's hard with people, because they think they don't have any sin, and they look down at everyone else. 
And so they won't, they act like the Pharisees. They won't touch them. They'll go around the other way and they won't help the person. They won't give of themselves. So many people today have children, they send them away. They'll give them little gifts here and there, but they won't give of themselves. They won't give their life, their time. I came back home years ago to give my life, to be with my children, to be with my wife, and to to walk with them through this life. That's called dying to self. It's not about going out and making a bunch of money and all these student loans right now that they're talking about forgiving it so he can buy votes and manipulate or whatever. These kids are learning and going deep in debt for things they don't even need. And they've not learned to know God. That's that's what they were created for, to know and love God and walk with him. They've been ripped off and they don't even know it by each generation before them that continues to follow the lies of the enemy. Each generation falls farther and farther away from God. It's not about Republican and Democrat. They're both falling away from God. We need to turn back, restore the past to dwell, and follow the old paths and to walk with him. But that has to happen in your life if you make that decision to do that. If you make the decision not to, then you'll have to live with that as well. It all starts at home. Love starts at home. Who's in your home? Is there even anybody there? If you live alone, you you do that by choice. You can open up your house and love strangers. What do you have to give? If you're in a wheelchair and you think, I am worthless, I can't do anything, that's ridiculous. You're not worthless. God has given you gifts. He wants to give you more gifts, spiritual gifts. But he's given you gifts to bless others and to love people. Are you using those gifts? There's people out there, they're hiding out in their house. They 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 can't even talk to people anymore. I had a friend once, and he, that's what he was doing. He had to get drunk before he could go and be around anybody. Otherwise, he couldn't. He just hid out in the house. And I'd get him out, and I'd talk to him, and, and he was scared. That's what the enemy wants to do, drive you into darkness and keep you there. Some people he'll drive out that way. Other people he'll have them trying to get all the attention there is in the world to themselves and exalt themselves and get people to follow them the wrong way that way too. And they're still walking in darkness. People that love money will make all these scriptures about surety for debts and and this and they'll, they'll they'll try to keep you from being a servant. And I'm not saying go jump in and you can't help everybody, but you can help somebody. And God knows who that somebody he wants you to help is. I'm only asking you to ask him. He always is right on time, and he always knows what he wants you to do. So just don't, just don't go out and do whatever, whenever. Ask him, and then do it. There's also people that I go out, they got money and they'll just flow, throw it around. God didn't tell you to do that. There'll be people that they got they got gifts and whatever and they'll just go out and do whatever. You're not supposed to just go out and do. And you're not supposed to just not do. You're supposed to ask him, what do you want me to do and when do you want me to do it? He knows when the person's right. He knows when their heart's ready to receive something. He needs and knows how he wants you to go about it. Some people won't receive it from your hand, but if you drop it off their door, that that's fine. He knows. He knows everything about the person that you're going to help. 
That's why you got to listen to him. Well, how do I go about this? What do you want me to do? Who is it? How do you want me to do it? When do you want me to do it? He'll make all that known. You just need to be ready to do it his way. Otherwise, we mess it all up. One time I was, uh, when I was a pastor, you know, I, you know, people say they take a vow of poverty. Well, I really, I really did. I didn't, I didn't have anything and I wasn't being paid anything from by anybody that went to church there. Whatever I had was like what Paul did, whatever my hands would go and do work and find to do, you know, that's the only money that I had. And the other stuff was all volunteering. And I didn't have squat. I mean, if I had five bucks in my pocket and that's all I had in the world, I mean, I at least I had something, and sometimes it wasn't that. That's just the truth, not making anything up. I walked out in the yard one day, and I walked over by the garden, and there was a rolled-up envelope. I thought it was a seed packet from the garden, I thought. It had a blue rubber band around it. And I thought, well, we left some seed out here or something, and... Because he took me right over to that spot God did. And so I could see it. And I thought, well, we left a seed packet out. And I picked it up. And I took the rubber band off. And I it, it, I unrolled it. And it was an envelope. And it had gotten wet. And my name was on the envelope. And then... And I could see that there was money through the envelope and I opened it up and there was 300 and some dollars. I don't remember exactly right now. You know, some $100 bills and whatever. And I thought, wow. And my name was on it. And I thought, that took faith for somebody to just put that in the yard, that much money, and just put it in the yard. And not have to be known that it was them. They didn't have to let anybody know that they did it. A lot of people have to let everybody get recognition, you know. And that, that I would find it. You know, they they trusted and they knew. And God let them to do that and they knew it would be okay. Could you do that? See. Another time, my neighbor came over. Old lady, she was a wonderful neighbor. And uh, I named one of my cows after her. And she came over, and she was literally trembling. And she said, I think somebody put this in the wrong mailbox. And she gave it to us. And they did. And it said, Children of God the Father, brothers and sisters of the Son, Jesus. And it had uh, several hundred dollars in it. You know, don't know who it was. They never. They didn't need to do that. I mean, they didn't need to make themselves known that they did it. It was it was the money was laid inside of a, you know how you had the uh, different colored like construction paper or whatever in school. Well, it was a piece of orange paper folded. It was written on that, and the money was inside of it. Th- this, those different kind of things would happen, and somebody knew from God that we needed help, and they obeyed. And I'm thankful that they did. I'm thankful that they did. And it was right on time. One time there was a fella. He lived down the road the next little town. And his mom was not well. She couldn't remember things. And she didn't know where she was or who she was half the time. And she would want to wander around and just walk off. And she used to be in the woman's army way, way back when. And I don't know if she just thought she was on the march again or what it was, but she would just take off walking. Or she, on a hot day, she would go sit in the car with the windows up, you know. And he drove a semi for somebody. And he finally just said, I got to stay home and take care of my mom. And he told his boss, and his boss said, you know, well, you'll have a job when you come back. And uh, that was rare. I didn't see people honor like that you know and he he did and God honored him for that and I had firewood and this man burnt wood and it was winter time and he didn't have any money 
And God put it on my heart to bring him wood and give him wood. And God would tell me when it was time to take him wood again. And I would just load up the wood and take it to him. And he said, how did you know? And I said, God told me. Had to make him feel pretty good and loved by God, didn't it? And, he, and I said, God told me. And I said, you're honoring your mom, and so you're honoring God in this, and so he's honoring you with this. And I wouldn't charge him anything. And it, it, it touched his heart. I know he never forgot that. He's gone now. And it got me too because I didn't have to call him. God just told me when it's time to take him wood. There's all kinds of things like that have happened in, in my life. And it's joyful, exciting, whatever you want to say, for him to work in your life and do things. And it doesn't always work out. I mean, he may send you to somebody and, and they don't they don't respond to God. They don't want him. They don't want you around. Um, but know this, what you did wasn't wasted. It'll, what you do in their life, how God uses you, will be a testimony for them or against them on Judgment Day. Nobody's going to say they didn't have a witness. Nobody's going to say that nobody told them. So, well, I'm going to sign off with that today. So be blessed and stay in the Word.